Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tokyo. Welcome to the Satellite Symposium. Uh, change in guidelines on non-sugar sweeteners and health. Where do we go from here? As you know, um, following the WHO guidelines on the sugar reduction of sugar consumption, there's been an increased utilization of uh, non-sugar sweeteners in food systems and in food products. Um, the evidence from randomized controlled trials have shown that there's little um, benefit in the short term on glucose metabolism and weight loss uh, with energy restriction um, when following the use of non-sugar sweeteners. However, there is no consensus on the long-term effects of non-sugar sweeteners. As such, WHO has, has put together draft guidelines um, for the use of, um, of non-sugar sweeteners. Um, this was launched, the draft guidelines was, uh, was launched in July uh, 2022 for public consultation. And here we are to talk about these guidelines, uh, to talk about the, the, uh, the, 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 the content the main takeaways and implications for achieving sugar reduction targets. So we thought it'd be appropriate to have this conversation and we have a, a group of experts to, to lead us in this uh, conversation today. I want to introduce, so my, my name is Dan Ramdath, my co-chair Cyril Kendall. Um, I'm going to hand over to him for, to introduce the first speaker. Uh, good morning everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us in uh, rainy Tokyo. Uh, hopefully the weather improves. Um, I think we have some excellent uh, speakers today. Uh, we're looking forward to their presentations. The first presenter is Dr. Ann Rabin, who is a professor in human nutrition um, at the Department of Nutrition, Exercise, and Sports Science at the University of Copenhagen. She's also a senior researcher in clinical research at the Copenhagen University Hospital. She has done extensive uh, clinical research on carbohydrates, specifically looking at the glycemic index, sucrose starch, and non-caloric sweeteners. Uh, she was the project coordinator for the preview study, which is the prevention of diabetes through lifestyle intervention and population studies in Europe and around the world. And she's currently leading the Horizon 2020 project, which focuses on the impact of sweeteners and sweeteners enhancers on health, obesity, safety, and sustainability. Uh, we look forward to your presentation and please. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, introduction, uh, Cyril. I'm very happy to, to be here and, and uh, I'm very happy to have had this opportunity to come and, and present uh, the work from uh, WHO and a little bit of something else and uh, also to be in Tokyo. I just have to get rid of my circadian misalignment, I think, to really enjoy it, but uh, Hopefully soon. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, wait a minute. So I will first talk about the WHO draft guideline on non, uh, yeah, non-sugar sweeteners in NS NSS or non-caloric sweeteners or. Uh, artificial sweeteners, as some call it, uh, so many names for the same uh, the same type of compounds, and the main takeaways from the WHO draft guidelines. So the WHO guidelines, it's not um, a reassessment of safety of of the sweeteners. Um, it's based on the evidence of health effects of sweeteners, and um, at levels that are already considered safe. So uh, this is not the scope of these guidelines. We already have the AD, ADI, so acceptable daily intake that have been assessed through numerous other uh, ways in vivo and vitro trials and, and uh, a lot of uh, calculations. So this is not the part of, of these guidelines, just to make that clear. But the WHO made uh, several systematic review and meta-analysis and uh, the focus today is on the most recent one. Uh, and that they had, um, they included studies with any type of sweetener, but not sugar alcohols and natural caloric sweeteners, such as, for instance, sucrose or fructose. Um, and whether they were specified by name or not, or whether they were used alone or in combination with other sweeteners. 
and they uh, included studies that used sweeteners within the ADI, so within the acceptable daily intake levels, and excluded studies that uh, explicitly exceeded those levels. So within normal range of intake of the sweeteners, the studies were, were included. Uh, they were also included if it was unclear if the ADI had been exceeded or not. So, for instance, in uh, prospective cohort studies where it's not always uh, specifically given what the amount is. The study designs and the duration. So it was uh, randomized controlled trials, uh, non-randomized controlled trials, and the population studies. So prospective cohort studies, case control studies, and cross-sectional studies. And the minimum intervention duration or follow-up was 13 days for blood lipids, one year for disease incidents, for instance, cancer or cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and seven days for all other outcomes in adults and children. So, for instance, body weight or glucose or insulin, etc. cetera. Um, they retrieved 8,000 records, uh, or, yeah, records, and... Uh, from those selected 370 that were eligible, and this resulted in 283 studies, unique studies in adults and children, pregnant women, or mixed populations. So this is quite, quite a lot of studies, I would say. Uh, 50 of them were randomized controlled trials, so about one-fifth, and five were non-randomized controlled trials. And then there were more than 200 observational studies, prospective cohort studies, and uh, some case control studies that are mainly relevant for, for, for instance, cancer, where you cannot really uh, maybe follow for a very long time, but you have uh, the possibility to study in, in those case control studies, and uh, 69 cross-sectional studies. And I'll come back to, to the evidence of these different kinds of studies. And then there were also some unregistered, or well, registered but ongoing studies that were not published um, yet as well, their results were not published yet. And they used the grading system or the grade system. So the grade, grade, grading of recommendations, assessments, development and evaluation of the different uh, studies that were included, the different review that were included. So for body weight, I will not go through all the results of, of this uh, quite extensive report that, or systematic review that they did, but some of the Ones that we have discussed, maybe, uh, well, all people and population looking at the sweetness and their effects on health. So body weight. Uh, WHO has made this very nice summary table. So if you're only interested in getting the fast results, you can just look at this table. Of course, there are many more details to, to look at uh, in the report and in the uh, supplemental material. When you look at the uh, body weight or BMI of uh, the randomized control trials, there's a clear reduction in both, significant reduction. And it's mostly in studies where sugars have been uh, used instead of, uh, well, sweetness have been used instead of sugar. In the case, uh, well, case control or cohort studies, it's the opposite. So we actually see an increase in incident obesity or BMI. When we look more closely into these different uh, uh, analysis, there are a number of forest plots uh, in the report, and uh, I will show some of them. This is a very, uh, well, popular, I would say, but also useful way of, of showing all the different studies that are included in the meta-analysis. And uh, the body weight was actually reduced by 0.7 kilogram uh, with sweeteners in the randomized controlled trials compared with at control, and this is this is not trivial. It's it's quite a nice amount of of uh, weight when you don't maybe intend to lose weight. When we looked at the different comparators, so was it compared sweetness compared with nothing or with sugar or with water? It's uh, clear that it's the sugar uh, replacement that really uh, makes a significant significant difference but not uh, with another or nothing or with water in this case, in this analysis. For the uh, prospective cohort studies, there was this positive association. 
And uh, the graphs only show a few studies actually, in total seven. So, um, which is a little bit surprising perhaps when you remember that there were more than 200 uh, population studies included. But uh, some of them looked at body weight or obesity, BMI or obesity. And here we see this um, positive association, which is significant. But we must remember that uh, population studies and randomized control trials are not the same. They don't have the same level of evidence according to the evidence hierarchy. So we have the randomized control trials almost in the top. In the top, we have the systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And then we have the cohort studies below, and then the other population studies or case reports, et cetera, even lower. So uh, the problem or the what one should remember, of course, with the uh, cohort or population studies is that we cannot really say what is the hen and what is the egg, what is the cause and what is the effect, because it might be that it's just a random association. Um, it could be reverse causality. Also, that could be confounding. So uh, when you have maybe a positive association with something, it can be due to the rest of the diet or your lifestyle. Um, I'll come back to that a little bit. And also, when was uh, dietary intake assessed? Was it only at baseline, for instance, and then you followed up the population for many years and assume that the population doesn't change their intake from baseline, which might be a little bit too simple. Um, and also for the reverse causality, if you think about people with diabetes, why would they, why would there be a positive association with sweetness? Maybe because they choose sweetness, because this is the way they can control their blood sugar compared with using sugar. So here it's the, the other way around. So you choose sweetness uh, because you have diabetes, you don't get diabetes because you choose sweetness. Um, we also looked at um, why there is the discrepancy in the literature in general, uh, with the, because some reviews find a positive, some find a negative effect of sweetness on body weight, for instance. And we um, did a so-called citation network analysis of reviews. So we tried to find all the reviews that existed in the literature at the time, 33, and they uh, included uh, 183 different art, including also some reviews. And uh, the network analysis showed that the, there was a clear pattern that reviews that reported a beneficial relationship of sweetness with body weight cited mainly randomized control trials, whereas those reporting an adverse relationship cited mainly observational studies. So there was something going on here that could explain maybe the um, different outcomes that we see. And this is a, a picture of, of such a network analysis. And in this case, it's uh, the, past, the beneficial effect of, uh, of sweetness on body, on body weight. So a decreased body weight with sweetness. And here it's uh, mainly randomized control trials, the green dots in the top that uh, that are cited. Okay. Network analysis, cohort studies, or observational studies, they mainly cite, um, well, the ones that show an adverse effect, as adverse association it is, most of the time, um, are population or observational studies. Okay, um, for risk of or incidence of type 2 diabetes, uh, there was also a very nice compilation of studies. And I'm just trying to move this little thing that is sitting there. Okay. Um, where for the randomized controlled trials, there were actually no uh, difference between sweetness and other compounds used or controls. But for the cohort or case control studies, there was a significant increase in type two diabetes or a significant association of sweetness with uh, type two diabetes incidence. And when we look at the uh, RCTs, this is just to show that it's actually correct, that there was no effect of sweetness on fasting glucose and insulin. Um, fasting glucose and insulin, 
And we also wanted to look at uh, postprandial glucose and insulin because we're not fast that ma many hours of the of the day most of the time. So uh, we wanted to look at what happens acutely when one consumes sweeteners versus a, another control. Uh, we had a number of studies included, 55 comparisons in total. And uh, we saw that there were no effects on acute postprandial glycemic or insulinemic response compared with a control. No effect. There have been other studies showing that there's no effect. So that's, that's at least quite clear, I think. Um, for the population studies, the prospective cohort studies, uh, now the WHO are looking at beverages, uh, mainly in this slide, this analysis. And there's a positive association. Uh, with sweeteners and type 2 diabetes, as I mentioned earlier. So one could speculate, why would there be a positive association? Uh, have they corrected for or adjusted for body weight, BMI, uh, the reverse causality I mentioned earlier, and also um, adjustment for energy intake is, of course, important. For the results of uh, risk of cancer, which has also been debated a lot in the literature uh, and among lay people. Um, they saw that there was actually no association um, overall with sweetness and, and cancer. I'm just trying to move a little picture. Okay, so no association here. They did see something with gallbladder, but it was not a strong evidence. It was a very low uh, level of evidence. So uh, to conclude on this um, systematic review and meta-analysis, which is the fourth of, uh, of the ones that have that been done by the WHO, um, they suggest, the results suggest that in the short term, sweeteners may lead to small reductions in adiposity without any significant impact on cardiovascular risk. But there is a suggestion of a negative health effect with long-term use but the evidence is ultimately, ultimately inconclusive. And they also recognize that there are differences between RCTs and observational studies. Still, um, the recommendation from the WHO uh, committee, so they say that uh, sweeteners should not be used as a means of achieving weight control or reducing risk of non-communicable diseases but it's a conditional recommendation, which means that they are less confident with this um, judgment. And the rationale for this recommendation is that there is no evidence of long-term benefits from sweetness and body fatness in adults and children. So what is long-term, you may ask, um, because... Um, the RCTs, uh, they say are short term, that can be challenged, I think, this terminology, but there's a low overall certainty of evidence and it does not represent a health benefit and may not be relevant in the long term, not in real world situations with the general population. But as I said, what is short term? Some, some of the RCTs were one year or longer, so I don't think we should call that short term. But of course, that can be discussed, I guess. Um, the very long-term uh, studies are usually the, the prospective cohort studies, population studies. And there you don't control for, for anything, of course, as we do in the randomized control trials. Um, the very low to low certainty of evidence for the long-term use of uh, sweeteners for type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, sorry, mortality, and short-term use during pregnancy or from observational studies. But uh, nevertheless, WHO stated that there are no desi undesirable effects or mitigating factors that would argue against not using sweeteners. Um, the evidence on sweeteners to replace sugars is, is largely indirect. Uh, so most RCTs using sweeteners to replace sugars do not explicitly assess the replacement of free sugars. One has to think a little bit about what that means, I think, because sweeteners are 
probably in the most most of the time used to replace uh, sugar. And that's also why they were invented in the first place, to help people with diabetes to control their glycemic levels in the blood. And uh, yeah, so that, that that's the most, well, normal situation, I would say. Uh, sweeteners are not essential dietary factors. I've had no nutritional value. Okay, that may be, uh, but it's an important sensory factor, sweetness. And it can increase diet compliance when on a diet. We've seen that in some studies, at least. And quality of life. That's surely also important. <laughs> um, and they also say that reduction of free sugars can be achieved without the use of sweeteners. So use uh, eat fruits, minimally processed unsweetened fruits and beverages. I'm not quite sure what the minimally processed has to do with the sweetener sugar business here, but that's one of the statements, at least from the WHO. Um, but we, we also know that we should reduce sugar intake and the sweeteners can actually uh, be an efficient way of doing that, both reducing sugar and energy. And the data from their own systematic review meta-analysis has showed that. Um, so also the, the question in this regard is, will the population appreciate a diet with very little or no sweetness? And how compliant would they be to such a diet without any or very little sweetness? For some, it may work, of course, but for some others, it may not. Uh, the public hearing that was conducted in July this year, um, there was a one hour session and people could uh, come with their comments. And Jenny Bram Miller, that many of you will know probably, uh, who's been working with carbohydrates and glycemic index for many, many years. She's concerned that this recommendation to reduce sugars uh, to less than five energy percent of the, of the calorie daily intake may have unintended consequences. Then uh, uh, people would choose starch perhaps instead, and mostly in high glycemic index perhaps, or and or low digestible sugars, and this could increase the risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and gastrointestinal conditions. Another uh, comment is uh, saying this, it's unclear what it's meant by adjusted for sugar intake or whether this is appropriate, since the putative beneficial effect of non-sugars are largely attributable to the replacement of free sugars in the diet rather than a benefit per se. And that's also interesting, I think. And then Barry Popking says um, several things, but I just took a few statements out of, of his input. First, we must ignore animal research in this area. For gram of body weight, mice have about 100 times the sweetness preference and reactivity as do humans. And much of the literature on mice provides extremely misleading evidence. I think we should remember that because, for instance, for the microbiota effects, this is mainly based on, on studies in, in rats and mice. And also he says that um, some of the reviews that have been conducted or the, the, the things that are misleading could be that the uh, diet that people consume is already unhealth, unhealthy. So when you adjust for an already unhealthy diet as they did in the Harvard and cardiac cohorts, they found that consumers of uh, sweetened beverages with an unhealthy Western diet had a higher risk, while those with a prudent, healthier diet had a significantly lower risk of cardiometabolic diseases. So this is really important, of course, to take into consideration. And that's the culprit or the, well, cave it off all cohort or population studies. Uh, some other remarks from WHO. It's recognized that sweeteners are not a homogenous class of compounds, uh, but limited evidence suggests that they differ um, in their physiological effects, but evidence is insufficient. But when you look at the different uh, sweeteners, just very nice picture from the paper by Magnussen published a few years ago. Uh, they have um, shown very clearly that the different sweeteners listed here 
and I'll just mention aspartame, uh, which is completely digested. It's two amino acids. It's metabolized and enters into the protein uh, synthesis in the human body. So nothing is excreted and it disappears. Whereas sucralose, for instance, uh, is completely or almost completely excreted in feces. So very different compounds, very different physiological effects. And um, a very nice intervention study was performed uh, by Higgins and Mattis, where they did a 12 weeks uh, study with uh, sucrose and four sweeteners and found that there were significant differences after 12 weeks in body weight. So uh, saccharin increased body weight as did sucrose, whereas uh, sucralose decreased body weight where, and aspartame and the glycoside compound did not have any effect. Uh, there has been a review also on stevia and no significant effect on BMI in this case in people with, without and with diabetes. But you can see also there are not that many studies at this time point at least. And uh, well, in, on average, they found that BMI was slightly lower with uh, stevia than with placebo, although not significant. Uh, WHO also had this uh, division in, in their many analysis. So for the aspartame, they saw a significant uh, reduction in body weight in the RCTs for saccharine as well, and for stevia, but sorry, but not for, for sucralose and ASK, for instance. So what should we do? <laughs> um, what are the implications for achieving sugar reduction targets based on these guidelines on sweeteners? So we should get rid of a lot of the sugar and have uh, the, a very small amount instead. Oh, sorry. sorry What's going on? Okay, I'll never forget this uh, this uh, presentation today. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, less than ten energy percent was a strong recommendation sugar intake, and uh, but rather lower than five energy percent. And how realistic is it? So, if with an energy need of, for instance, ten megajoule per day, uh, you should max have sixty gram uh, sugar added sugar per day with 10 or 30 gram with five. And if you have smaller energy needs, of course, even smaller amounts. And uh, just one statistics that can be found uh, in when you look for this, um, showing how much, how much do individuals consume. Uh, this is from the World Atlas website. Uh, we see that uh, the United States is a top scorer with 126 gram. Whereas uh, Canada is lowest in this top 10, but uh, I don't know what, where Denmark is in this, but uh, probably somewhere in between. Um, so that's a lot, very long way from the recommended levels to, uh, to the current intake, the recommended max levels to the current intake. And the American Heart Association even suggests uh, stricter added sugar limits. 24 gram for most adult women and 36 gram for most adult men. So when we look at uh, total energy intake from the systematic review and meta analysis, it's a significant, there's a significant decrease in the RCTs, both energy and sugar intake. Uh, for the cohort or case control studies, it says that there are no data, which in a way is a bit surprising, but that's the way it is apparently. So the energy intake is reduced with 570 kilojoule per day with sweetness in the RCTs. That's that's an that's a, an amount that is well, it's um, it ha will have an effect in the long term if it's kept, of course. Um, and the energy intake was mainly reduced when sweetness replaced sugar. Maybe not so surprising. Um, and the sugar intake was decreased with 38 gram per day when, when sugars were replaced 
or Sweden has replaced Juga. So that's also a reasonable amount. So sweeteners seem to be helpful to reduce energy intake and sugars intake. And that's what the recommendations ask us to do. But there are of course many, many things still to consider. We have been working now for four years with the sweet project. Um, it's um, mentioned a little bit by, by Cyril in the beginning. It's We want to look at the barriers and facilitators to the use of sweetness and sweetness enhancers. That's what we call it. Um, and the risks and benefits uh, in the context of health, obesity, safety, and sustainability. We also look at sweet preference, microbiota, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of things. Um, one, well, I will just show the work packages. We have innovation and production, the industry partners mainly, short-term acute intervention studies, uh, a one-year, we call it long-term, clinical uh, intervention study, population-based studies, and then we have sustainability, which I think is also important to, to look at in this context, and stakeholder engagement. So the sweetener, of course, it's very important to look at the health effects, but we also talk a lot about sustainability. In Denmark, a lot of especially young people, students are going all vegan now, and, and uh, there's a lot of hype about being sustainable, which is, of course, very good. But uh, we should maybe also look at this in this context. And, of course, the health is important, but also the uh, responsible consumption and production. And we had this work package in suite where the, the preliminary results are, are there now. So what happens when you replace added sugar with sweeteners? What do you think? Will it be better or worse for global warming? <laughs> Who says better? Who says worse? Who says don't know? <laughs> okay. So uh, our partners in the project uh, in, um, in the UK cycle sustainability assessment of sweeteners in the context of diets. There are a lot of uh, assumptions and a lot of things that one must consider when doing these kind of analysis. And I will not go into it, just mention that it's not completely easy. But uh, it was done and um, five different sweeteners were investigated. So stevia, glycosides, thomatin, sucralose, aspartame, and neotame. And this is the first work for the sucralose, thomatin, and neotame, and the first for European stevia glycosides that has ever been done. So um, what does it show? The life cycle assessment here, where it's global warming production in the, in the y-axis, and the different sweetness. So sucrose is the comparator. So we see the sugar is up here in the very, very top, and the sweeteners are all much lower in global warming production. So they reduce the warming, or uh, not production, potential compared to sugar for comparative sweetness. It's not per gram, of course, gram for gram, it's for unit sweetness. Hmm? So some concluding remarks before I hand over the floor to, to John for a hopefully more successful event. <laughs> uh, the RCTs, uh, body weight was reduced with sweetness, cardiometabolic risk factors not affected, low certainty of evidence according to the WHO SRMA. The cohort studies, sweetness associated with increased body weight or obesity, risk of type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease with a very low certainty of evidence, and we should be careful here, as I mentioned, reverse causality can very well be in play. What is the habitual diet and lifestyle and when was the dietary assessment done? Uh, the report also showed that sweeteners were connected with a reduced daily sugar and energy intake in the RCTs. They couldn't say anything from the cohort studies. Still, uh, it is suggested that sweeteners are not used as a means of achieving weight control or reducing risk of non-communicable diseases, but it's a conditional recommendation. And from the sweet project, just the few very preliminary data. 
uh, on the sustainability aspects that I thought was interesting to mention. Uh, much lower global warming potential uh, for sweeteners compared with sugar. So there's still a lot of, of work to do. For, uh, for instance, longer term RCTs, and we have to define what is longer, what is long compared to what we already have. Uh, also, there's a lot of debate on sweet preference. Do we eat more sweet if we are exposed to more sweetness or what happens really? Um, what happens with the microbiota and the microbiota that is interesting in relation to cardiometabolic health or, or other health aspects? Is it even important? The very, very, very small amounts that, that we consume from the non-caloric sweeteners, does it really have an effect? We need to see that from human studies and not from animal studies. And then finally, I thought it could be relevant also to talk about personalized nutrition for sweeteners because of, of course, not one sweetener would fit all, I assume. So if there's any effect of the sweeteners on, on health, then we could speculate that there are different effects of the different sweeteners in different people. Thank you. Well, first of all, all my sweet colleagues, my colleagues at home. And thank you for listening to this extraordinary presentation. Uh, thank you, Anne, for a, a very interesting <laughs> presentation and for your perseverance. Uh, we're not going to do questions and answers right now. We're going to wait till the end of the uh, all the presentations where we'll have a panel discussion.